We need bigger GPUs. That phrase from Jensen encapsulates NVIDIA's sales pitch for Blackwell's first GPUs, the B200 and B100. The key innovation here for these AI-focused GPUs comes not really from NVIDIA, but from TSMC. By providing NVIDIA with a way to link two GPU dies together so that they work as one. This isn't the same as chiplets, mind you, but how will this translate to the Blackwell-based gaming GPUs? Is NVIDIA going to link two GPU dies together for those as well? Surely not, as that would be way too expensive, right? Well, perhaps there's actually something to that, and it was right under our noses for the last several years. Today's video is sponsored by urcdkeys.com. If you want to activate your Windows, you can pay Microsoft $100 or more for a Windows 10 Pro key. Or you can get one from an OEM seller like URCD Keys, who have partnered with Cortex for a discount on what is already a really low price, for a total of just $15 when you use my code. The keys work globally, and you can even use them to upgrade to Windows 11. After you've made your purchase, you will find your key in your purchased orders on the URCD Keys website. Click on Get Keys and copy the key. Then in Windows, click on Start and type Activate, and then click Activation Settings. Then click Change Product Key, paste your key you just purchased, and click Next. That's it. Windows is activated. URCD Keys is having a mid-March madness sale. In addition to Windows 10 Pro, you can also get Windows 11 Pro at a discount with my code, and even Office 2021 using that same discount. A huge thanks to URCD Keys for sponsoring today's video. Check the links in the description to get your cheap OEM Windows key today. If you've been following the PC space for at least a few years, you might remember that NVIDIA introduced half-precision FP16 units in the Pascal generation in 2016, and followed that up with tensor core matrix engines in Volta in 2017, fixed function that targets machine learning workloads. For the last eight years, NVIDIA's GPUs have gradually evolved to be compute engines first and pixel pushes second. Hopper introduced a transformer engine with 4-bit precision. The new microarchitecture, codenamed Blackwell, follows up on Hopper's focus on AI, particularly large language models that support generative AI, and with the added inference optimization that comes with support for fine-grained scaling of FP4. One of the key data points from NVIDIA's Blackwell presentation was Jensen's description of the new chip, saying the following. We didn't change the architecture of Hopper. We just made it a bigger chip. We just used the latest, the greatest 10 terabyte per second interconnect. We connected the two chips together. We got this giant 200 billion parameter chip. Jensen Huang said this while showing this chart. At first glance, it looks like Blackwell is 30 times faster than Hopper in inference. As such, maybe we can extrapolate from that that the jump in performance from the Hopper microarchitecture to Blackwell is truly gigantic. But you'll notice that the real jump in performance is actually from the blue line to the purple line. That's apples to apples. That's FP8 versus FP8. The green line is FP4, which only worked as an adaptive precision range in Hopper. NVIDIA's charts at these presentations always try to present a much greater uplift than is factual, because inference is becoming a larger slice of the AI challenge. It makes some sense to try and show how good Blackwell is at that particular workload. You don't need that much precision for the generation stage. You just need to generate convincing and satisfactory results, so FP4 is sufficient. Nevertheless, it's a chart that might mislead those not paying close attention. Also, it should be noted that this doesn't apply to training. People are having trouble getting FP8 to work, let alone FP4 and FP6. But anyway, Jensen's admission that Blackwell is just over twice as fast as Hopper because it's two chips versus one chip effectively means that really what NVIDIA has done is take advantage of TSMC's modest node optimization from 4N to 4NP, and more importantly, the much larger area available to fit more transistors in, particularly cache. So 
So rather than challenge the paradigm and approach AI hardware from a different angle, NVIDIA has gone beyond the physical limits and doubled down on brute forcing GPU performance through larger transistor counts. In this case, over twice the amount of transistors by combining two radical sized chips. In some sense, this is analogous to what Apple has been doing with their M series of chips, particularly the Ultra variant. When it comes to joining two chips together in a memory coherent system, Apple's marketing calls this Ultra Fusion architecture, while Nvidia calls it NVHBI, or High Bandwidth Interface. The principle is the same, using high speed fabric links to couple two identical chips together, thus doubling the performance. In Nvidia's case, the chip to chip speed is 10 terabyte per second. Note that this isn't quite the same as chiplets, because these connected chips here function effectively as one unified chip. Both in the case of Apple and Nvidia, the credit really has to go to TSMC for their advances in packaging technology, which effectively have allowed Nvidia to go beyond the rectical limit. <laughs> that, of course, doesn't come cheap. It's a lot of silicon, and it's no wonder Nvidia isn't moving beyond the 5 nanometer TSMC variants here, but rather staying at a more mature node, thus avoiding costly wafer defects that would result in a ton of wasted dyes. Still, it's estimated that a dual-chip Blackwell B200 costs $6,000 to manufacture, and that can mean very bad news for gamers. Well, for poor gamers at least, it seems logical that Nvidia will stick to the 4NP process node for the Blackwell gaming GPUs. In fact, as I write this, Twitter leaker copite 7 kimi has shared that GB202 will indeed share the same process node as GB100, so that's 4NP. Back in October of last year, I made a video discussing this, and I said back then that the performance uplifts would be very modest, basically whatever uplift the node transition would allow for. Back then, the rumors were saying that the 5090 would be 70% faster than the 4090, a claim that I disputed. My estimate was an increase of around 25-30%, to and now Copite is claiming a 30% density increase, which is closer to my estimate. But would 70% be possible now that we've seen Blackwell? If we do some rough calculations on how many more transistors Nvidia managed to cram into Blackwell compared to ADA, we see that ADA's GA100 had a maximum of 54.2 billion transistors at radical size, but that was on 7 nanometer. So a more fitting comparison for our purposes would be Hopper. Hopper's GH100 has 80 billion transistors at max radical size, while Blackwell has 208 billion transistors across two dies, which means roughly 104 billion transistors per die. So you get a 30% increase in the number of transistors from Hopper to Blackwell, and roughly the same should be the case going from the 4090 to the 5090. Now that would be a transition from TSMC's 4N process to 4NP, an optimized version, but it should be noted that the 4090 is on 5 Van. All of these nodes aren't part of the same 5 nanometer generation, but there's still density gains between each. So it's possible there's a further optimization here compared to 5N. It's thought that the N in these names comes from Nvidia, by the way, as in TSMC specifically optimizes these nodes for Nvidia's ASICs. Now, the 5090 would not be a full reticle size chip. It will likely be smaller, but still, 30% sounds about right. However, if you look closely at at the illustration diagram that Nvidia showed, and assuming this closely matches the actual topology, you see eight blocks of compute distributed symmetrically across the two joint chips. And that's a one-to-one -one pairing with the HBM memory stacks. So this is a chip purpose-built for this configuration, and does not represent the chip we will get with the 5090, which certainly won't have HBM memory. But note that this symmetry was already present in H1 100 and GA100, where the chip is divided by L2 cache that communicates with the other half. And that's the part that's relevant here. I always assumed this was just for redundancy, better yields and scalability, but it seems Nvidia was already laying the ground for this multiple die strategy back when they launched Ada and Hopper. If we look at AD102, annotated here by Locuza on Twitter, we see that it too was a symmetrical design, with split L2 cache connected the two halves, and the same with Hopper, with a crossbar link. If that design philosophy translated from Hopper to Blackwell in two separate chips linked together, it stands to reason that the Blackwell gaming
gaming GPUs will see a similar symmetrical configuration. And at the very top SKU, the 5090 will feature two dies linked together. So that 30% increase in transistors, plus say a 5% increase considering the fact that the 4090 was on the first generation of 5 nanometer, means that the 5090 would indeed be around 70% faster than the 4090 in a two die configuration. The 30% uplift that I estimated back in October of last year would be true, yes, but for one die configuration. So that could be a 5080. The naming scheme here doesn't really matter. It could be that the 5090 Ti is two dies and the 5090 is one die, but you get the point. Given that it's unlikely that the 5090 will be a radical sized chip, it remains to be seen if it can indeed reach that 70% increase. Further increases could come from architectural changes, like large L1 caches in DSM units, for instance. So why is this bad news for gamers? <laughs> well, can you imagine what Nvidia will charge for a graphics card with two linked gigantic GPU dies if the 4090 was selling for around two grand in the street when it came out? It's not crazy to think that the 5090 90 will sell for twice as that, at four grand street prices. It should be noted that for the same price as a 4090, presumably, you will still be able to get a roughly 30 to 35% performance increase on what Nvidia could call, let's say, the 5080. And this would also explain why there are rumors circulating that AMD is not launching a top tier GPU to compete with Nvidia this gen, seeing as AMD doesn't have the possibility to do two linked dies based on their previous work for RDNA, at least not for this generation. A larger 7900 XTX on a newer node would probably only compete with a 5080, offering a 30 to 35% performance increase. But there's no way it would catch up to a 70% faster GPU like the 5090. I'll be doing a more in-depth analysis of the Nvidia presentation as there are some other things that are worth discussing, but I wanted to get this very speculative thesis out, <laughs> let's call it, to get your guys' feedback. Do you think Nvidia is really launching a two-die GPU for the consumer market? Would the cost of that be worth it for Nvidia? More importantly, and I need your honest answer here, would you spend $4,000 on a GPU that performs 70% faster than a 4090? Or would you spend, let's say, $1,500 to $2,000 on a 5080 if it's 30% faster than a 4090? Let me know in the comments below. And since you're here, be sure to join my Patreon for more analysis and top-tier content. I have plenty of videos coming but I need your support to keep the channel going, as income has been following the opposite trend of Nvidia's stock. It's going down, down, down. So join my Patreon today by following the link in the description or the end card. Thanks for watching and until the next one.